Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to episode five of Everything You Love. I'm so glad you decided to join me. I'm Rob Arnold. If you're new to the show, welcome aboard. If you've been along for the ride, it's so good to see you back, and thanks for spending your time with me. Really appreciate it. Uh, in this episode, we're just going to get back to answering questions. I still got a lot of them, and I'm excited to answer those. And uh, before we do, I just wanted to um, remind people that below this video here, there's a description section where you can check out all sorts of stuff that you may find relevant. You just hit that little show more button there and below is a ton of information, links uh, to where you can find me on all the socials and what type of gear I'm using. Uh, on mobile, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's harder to find. There's that little arrow right there that you gotta click next to the video title. And then a whole new world opens below again with all that same information that you may wanna check out. So for in the future, I just wanted you to be aware that there's information down there, again, that, that you may find useful. Today's show, I'm going to be covering a wide range of topics, starting with uh, kind of some about the process of how Matt and I would go about recording guitars for Chimera. I'm also going to uh, go into my, my dream band situation. If I could put together a band uh, from any guys dead or alive to hypothetically put together my dream band, um, I'm going to talk about that. Also going to go a lot in, into my influences and how I got into metal and the bands that really helped shape and develop my style. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to conclude with kind of a, a two-part thing where I talk about how Chimera came across our ESP endorsement, which also leads into uh, the story about our involvement with Stefan Carpenter from the Deftones and uh, the song Rizzo that we wrote together for the Pass Out of Existence album. Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about that, so I'm excited to answer it and talk about it. And um, yeah, let's let's just get started. First one we got is from Bobby Lackey on Twitter, and he says, "What's up, Rob? I was wondering how the writing process worked in Chimera. Were you the main music writer or the only writer? Also, when it came to recording, did you record your guitar parts then, Matt, or did the writer only get recorded to keep it tighter? Thanks." Nice little rhyme there. Did the writer only get recorded to keep it tighter? Um, I obviously had a, a big part to do with with the writing process in Chimera, but that's because I just took a lot of initiative towards that. I'm somebody that whatever I'm involved in, like I, I need to get into it. And um, I just like to have a, a say in what's going on, have a say in the outcome. So I just kind of work myself into that position to, to write a lot of stuff. And I was fortunate that the material the other guys in the band thought was cool because I'm sure there are guys that want to be a big part of that as well, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it just doesn't work out for some reason. So I'm just fortunate that that worked out for me. But uh, we, we wrote as a unit. Um, I'd say our best material was written as a unit. Um, but yeah, I had a lot to do with it. Always did. Uh, and then when it came to recording, did you record your guitar parts then, Matt? Or did the writer only get recorded to keep it tighter? Well, there's something interesting that, that I thought of. Um, back before we actually went to record Pass Out of Existence, I have this memory of us talking about who was going to record what songs. We, uh, we, we knew that we were about to head out to LA to, to record the record. And we were kind of like, well, how, how are we going to do this? How do we want to do this? And so I remember I can picture Mark sitting on the drum riser and Jason Hagar, Camille's original guitarist, and I would sit there and, and we'd play the riffs back and forth. And Mark was almost like judging to see who played it better. And we decided that way, okay, Rob's going to record this song, Jason's going to, you know, just stuff like that. It was, it was interesting. But what that was leading towards is, I think, how we began to start recording Camille, like from the impossibility on, um, which was that whoever kind of had the most to do with writing the song was was generally like a little bit better at it I, I guess and that would be the person that that recorded the song the majority of it the main rhythms left and right now there are pros and cons to, to that if you have two super tight players that know the material really well having one guy do the right side and having one guy do the left side can make a beefier guitar sound because kind of the tighter the thing the guitars are the thinner they are actually it's not always bad or good, um, but it can be thickened up by two different performances for sure. But sometimes under the microscope of recording, you run into issues like picking patterns or the way somebody's strumming. You know, like for instance, lots of times 
when I'd watch Matt recording something, I'd be like, oh, that's the way you play it? I've been playing it like this. And he would say the same thing to me a lot of the time because when you're jamming in, in, in the practice space and it's loud and there's full stacks there and everybody's in the room, you can't hear the little minutia of, of somebody's picking pattern or something. But when you're, again, under that microscope in the studio, a lot of time you see something and you're like, ah, it might be tighter if you picked it like I picked it on my side or vice versa. And for somebody who's just about to record their part, they have to rearrange their playing and their thinking. So some we found that it was better to have one guy do the left and the right so that the picking was exactly the same, the strumming was exactly the same, all the, just the little, the little, little things just all, all lined up and, and that's what we liked. Again, that isn't right or wrong for other bands, but, but that's how we decided to do it and it's certainly how I encourage bands uh, to do it if, if I'm tracking them. I'd like one guitar player to, to play each side. Now, the other guitar player would definitely play his parts, like Matt would come in and play all the, the harmonies or melodies that he was playing for, for his parts and I would do that on songs that he would record and we would just kind of set that up beforehand, who was going to do what, and figure that out. And the more prepared you can be entering the studio, just the more efficient you'll be, and the better things will turn out. Next here, Darren Mark Diggle on Facebook. I have subscribed to your YouTube page, Rob. Thank you. And I've got a Q&A for you, and here it goes. If you could start a covers band, who would you do it with? Can be still alive or die? Hmm. Well, let's see, I gotta say that uh, when it comes to a singer, you know, I've been watching Phil Anselmo and the Illegals all this last summer. They were out there doing a Pantera set on the festivals, I think mainly in Europe, maybe here in the States too, I don't know. But uh, I've been watching and I've been so stoked on it. I think the band sounds great. They've getting better and better each night as they're getting more comfortable playing and stuff. I mean, think of those shoes the other players and the Illegals are filling. You know, Vinny, Rex, Dime, to have to play that stuff. And I see him getting better and more comfortable. And I think Phil's just been on fire. He sounds great. He always has. I've always thought Phil is the man. Um, and so speaking of that, it's like kind of the first time that I like watching these videos where I got like really envious. I was like, man, I wish I was in that band. I wish I got the call to play with those guys and, you know, whatever. But so anyways, Phil, Phil would be my singer. And then drummer, my favorite drummers, Lars, Paul Bostaff, Igor Cavalera, all, all awesome players. But if it came down to it, if Phil was my singer, I think I'd have Igor behind the kit. He's just got this power. In fact, just this morning on the way here to the studio, uh, Roots Bloody Roots was on liquid metal and just what a song, what an album, what an era for Sepultura. I mean, I love all their early stuff, but especially Chaos AD and Roots, huge albums for me, uh, influence-wise, and Igor's playing is just monstrous, super tribal, just totally badass, so I have to go with Igor. I'd love to hear him and Phil together. I wonder if they ever have. Uh, bass player, Ellefson, Dave Ellefson from Megadeth. Not only is he the nicest guy ever, super cool, but I mean, he's just a amazing bass player. He's just perfect all the time. Uh, totally in the pocket, great metal bass player. His sound is just cuts through, interesting lines. I've always, I'm a huge Megadeth fan. I've always loved Ellison. So man, I've had the pleasure of jamming with him before um, at, at a NAM. We played some, some Megadeth tunes, some maybe some Priest tunes, stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. He's just a, a true professional. Don't need to say that. He's the bass player of Megadeth, for Christ's sake. Um, and then, yeah, that'd be it. Lead guitar, if there was another guitar player, Marty Friedman, maybe. I'd just be the rhythm guy and let, let Marty do the lead work. So anyways, it's a cool thought to think about. Me, Anselmo, Anselmo, Cavalera, Ellison, maybe Marty Friedman. Jonathan Angel Marquez on Facebook asks, you've shared the stage with many amazing bands. What was one that you were very impressed by and why? Been impressed by a lot of bands over the years for sure, but this is kind of, I don't know, the first one that comes to mind because I got a story to tell about it. Um, in 2007, we were doing the uh, Sounds of the Underground tour and Opeth was on. And I wasn't an Opeth fan yet. I, I kind of just 
didn't know about them. Mark and Andals had talked about them plenty of times. They loved, it was, it was the Ghost Reveries cycle, which is just a phenomenal record. Everyone that knows that record's like, yeah, duh. If you don't know that record, check it out. Ghost Reveries, just insane. But I didn't know about it yet at the time. I, I, I didn't care yet. And they played every night on this tour. I'd hear them. You know, we'd laugh about uh, Michael's rhetoric in between songs because he's just so, like, monotone, but still he's got a great sense of humor. And, you know, we'd, we'd catch on to his sayings and things and Sam on our bus in his, in his Swedish accent. And, um, you know, a lot of their melodies are real contagious, and we'd put our own lyrics to their, to their doom, doom, doom. Do, 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 do. We'd like do parodies of those, all in, all in good fun though. We respected them. But, anyways, time passed. We played with them again in 09 at the at the Dubai Desert Rock Festival. And again, I just didn't really pay attention. But then one day I was at home. I got music choice on in the background. I'm doing something, and all of a sudden this song comes on, and I'm like, "Whoa, what is this? This is awesome!" And I go and look, and it's "Demon of the Fall" by Opeth off their "My Arms Your Hearse" album. Turns out, in my iTunes, I had this album, put it on, hooked ever since. Started, went, got their whole catalog. Um, I know there's a lot of debate about their their early stuff and how people don't like how Michael doesn't scream anymore or do the do the guttural vocals anymore. Um, doesn't bother me. I think Pale Communion is the sickest record. Watershed, obviously, um, love their new one. So I, th- they could do no wrong for me. I love everything. Incredible players. And I think back, man, I wasted all those times sharing the stage with them that I didn't pay attention that now I wish I could, I could go back I could have just stood on the side of the stage and watched them every night if I wanted to and I didn't so anyways to answer your question that's a band that that I've shared the stage with stage with a lot of times and um and now I just have a huge respect for them and um and when I watch their their videos now I just love them they're perfect a lot of times as I'm listening to them in my car or whatever I think man how are they going to pull this orchestration off live or whatever and they totally do they they make it all happen live and they sound great, and my hat's off to them. Fred, their lead guitar player, dude, I think he's the modern Marty Friedman. His solos are so sick, so tasty. Just great player, great guys, great band. Okay. Greg Cooper on Facebook says, As a guitarist, you speak through your riffs, tone, and progressions, some based on a groove, some on a feel, and some entirely on accident. Some for fun, some for commercial gain, and some, the ones I'm interested in, come from somewhere inside your soul. And here's the question. What's your one lead or touch that regardless of where you are and how old it might be, resonates, makes the hair on your arm stand up, and gives you chills or even flashbacks to its inspiration? Well, Greg, I'm not exactly sure if you mean one of my own riffs that I wrote or somebody else's riff from music, some music or album that I love that, uh, that when I hear it, I, I still love it and, and get a great feeling about it every time. So because I'm not sure of that, I actually thought of an answer that would cover both scenarios. So I'm actually going to give an example here. Oh. In... Um, in Holy Wars, off Rust in Peace, midway through the tune, in the break, Marty goes to this amazing Arabic sounding little clean riff. Anybody who's heard the song knows it. Anybody that doesn't know it, I'll link it right here. Um, but it's this killer little thing I've loved since the second I heard it, just like everybody else, it's, it's the bomb. Um, and I've never really been able to play it. Marty's playing has just kind of been untouchable to me. I, I can never grasp his style, although I love it so much. I love the note, his note choices, his inflection, uh, just the sound he has. It's that like kind of like harmonic minor, uh, exotic Middle Eastern sound that, yeah, people say my sound has some of, but it still doesn't touch his at all. But he has been a major influence in me, just his tones and note choices. So... Uh, I've always loved that part, and while I was writing The Flame, it came to this section where it kind of was a good place to put a little something like that. And I'll never say that this compares to Marty's part at all, but it was my little chance to do something like it to show off my inspiration. And it's that part in The Flame. There it is. 
Ali Ray on Facebook asks, did you struggle to get your hands to cooperate with your melody ideas at all when starting, especially the pinky? My pinky needs to obey. I guess my honest answer is no, because I think that f being able to think of a melody is the hard part. Playing is actually the easy part. Anybody can play as long as you have the ambition and the, the, the dedication and the discipline and, and you're either taught or self-taught or something like, I think that people can be taught to really do anything as, as long as they dedicate themselves to it. But something more abstract and intangible like coming up with melodies and things like that in your mind is a harder thing. So playing is the easy part, coming up with the melody is the hard part. So not everybody can come up with melodies. There are super shredder guys that can play a million notes a second and stuff like that, but they can't write a song to save their life or, or write cool melodies or whatever. So if that's your problem, if you can write melodies but you can't translate it to the guitar, just give it time, practice, practice, practice. The same goes along with your pinky. People aren't gonna like to hear this, but I say it all the time. If you have trouble using your pinky, it's because you don't practice enough. Practice, practice, practice. All right, um, I'm gonna combine these two questions here. Colt Ward on Facebook asks, almost every riff I've come up with was inspired by a great band, Beatus, Slayer, The Black Dahlia Murder, Mashuga, to name a few. Who are your main inspirations for riffs you write? Or maybe just your favorite bands? And then also, Aaron Swadener, what's up Aaron? On Facebook asks, you've always been very open with your gear, settings, etc., which is awesome for budding metal guitarists. Who would you say inspired your playing the most, say top five, and are there any newer players you draw inspiration from? Um, last first here, the new, uh, newer players. Again, it's uh, Fred from Opeth, incredible player, and I'm totally inspired by him and hear him, and it makes me think, man, I got, I got to try harder, I got to push harder. Um, but back to my original inspiration for writing riffs and my favorite bands and stuff like, well, you know, obviously everybody knows I'm an enormous Metallica fan. And a lot of the time, it's not just players in the band individually, it's what those, that group of players does. So while Kirk and James are some of my favorite guitar players, <coughs> it's the combination that, of, of them with Lars, um, you know, that creates a sound. Same with, with Megadeth, Pantera, you know, all the, all, I love Dime, but all the Pantera guys are, are badasses, you know, and it's, it's their, their style and their attitude and their swagger, their charisma, their energy that they create together, that chemistry um, that makes them awesome. So while I'm influenced by a lot of players individually, I'd say these bands, you know, my favorite bands, obviously I said Metallica, Megadeth, Pantera, Slayer, Sepultura, Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angel, Alice in Chains, Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, you know, it could go Fear Factory, Machine Head, Rage Against the Machine. All those bands made a sound that just like, like any player, you know, it absorbed into my mind as a kid and the riffs that I would play were influenced by those bands and um, I'm just lucky that people like them and like that sound because it's just natural to me and I'm just playing what the stuff I like to hear, you know, so it's... Uh, fortunate to have grown up on those bands you know so just like we all were cody ross on facebook asks what inspired you to play metal and what helped cultivate your writing style you have a very distinct sound that i felt no other guitar player has well those are high words of praise thank you very much cody um what inspired me to play metal <clears throat> um well when i was in third grade there was a kid in my class with long hair. And for some reason I was intrigued by that and we became friends. And I went over to his house one day and he had like three older brothers and they had gear in the garage. They had a setup, drums, guitars, amps. Throughout the entire house there were guitars and amps everywhere. Guitar picks in the refrigerator, in the bathroom, in, uh, on the, around the kitchen sink. Maiden posters, Van Halen posters. I remember like like being scared spending the night there sometimes because like uh, I'd see, um, you know, uh, 
Eddie, the, the, all the Iron Maiden posters were like, you know, that the Eddie on the cover of the Iron Maiden albums and stuff. And I'd be like, whoa. Um, and, and I think at the time, my sister, you know, this is like the late 80s. And my sister was into like Bon Jovi, maybe Skid Row, Motley Crue, or maybe she was having boyfriends come over that would, they would bring this music around. And I started getting an interest. And, and one day at Quartz, uh, the dude in my class, his name was Court. Um, you know, I was over there. And he grabbed a guitar. This is what he played me. I was hooked. I went home right away, rode my bike home, and I'm like, Ma, I gotta get a guitar. Um, and, and that was it. You know, I started, I took some lessons, I, I, I got an acoustic, and uh, it was a little bit of time before I got my first electric, which is another story I'll tell sometime. But uh, that all started it for me. And then from there, you know, I just, you just, like, like, like any kid, you know, when, once, you, once you just get into metal, you start absorbing everything. You want more, more, more. You start hearing Metallica. You know, you start hearing Megadeth, and you, you hear heavier, and you want heavier and heavier. And all of a sudden, you know, for a lot of people like me, I start hearing Deicide and Cannibal Corpse and things, and you just go down the rabbit hole. And before you know it, you, you, you're friends with a bunch of people that are into the same thing. And whether you're going to shows or playing all the time. I mean, like, I couldn't wait getting home from school just to get in the garage and play Metallica tunes with my buddies, whether we'd have no drummer or no singer or whatever, but just trying to play the solos of the parts, like, in one or fade to black. And that's how I developed my style, just playing that stuff, just doing it every day with dudes, like, playing playing all the time. Um, and just did it like anybody else, you know, but, but I, I kept going, kept pushing, kept playing in bands. I would not stop. I wouldn't give up. And, um, it worked out. <laughs> Michelle Dosky on Facebook. What would you say if I told you I still have pics and letters from high school? Let's drop out of school and become musicians. He said, it will be fun. He said, hi, Michelle. So Michelle, uh, was, was a, a girl from high school that I, I had this other buddy. They, they live kind of like next door to each other. And um, so he, my buddy introduced me to Michelle, who had a drum set in her basement. Um, what was that, a Pearl Export series or something? Anyways, it was awesome. I loved anybody that had gear, uh, especially, and this is probably like ninth, 10th grade, something like that. So we started jamming right away, found a couple other guys, Brian Denton, Chuck Dar. Uh, we started playing For Whom the Bell Tolls, maybe, I don't know, Seek and Destroy, something, the ones that, that everybody starts playing, you know? Maybe we wrote a couple originals. I don't even recall at this point. Um, but uh, anyways, what do we call ourselves? Serenity. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, Michelle, I may have said to her at, the, at that time, like, you know, we need to just drop out of high school and do this. Because I, I, I knew I was intent on doing music back then, for sure. You know, I wanted to do it. And um, I wouldn't have really ever dropped out of school. My parents would have never allowed that. But um Anyways, it's just funny thinking back that, um, you know, my intentions were pure back then and somehow I muscled through. I think, so Serenity, I kind of like uh, morphed into Sanctum, which is the band I started with a couple other guys where I actually started playing drums in and then eventually brought in Andals and that's how my relationship with Andals started, who eventually brought to Kamira. So um, Michelle has been around since the beginning of my, my Cleveland jamming days because I, I lived in Phoenix before that and uh, yeah. Anyways, good stuff, Michelle. All right, I'm gonna close out with a combination of, of questions here that kind of tie in with one another and, and I'm getting asked a lot about. Joseph Cool on Instagram asks, how did you start come to start playing ESP guitars? How did the endorsement come about? And then kweet89 on Instagram asks, I saw Steph Carpenter has credits on Rizzo. What riff is he playing or is he playing the whole song? So this is a cool story that they're both tied into one another. This is all from my recollection. Right before Kamira went to LA from Cleveland to record Pass Out of Existence, Mark and Jim flew out there to meet like with our new manager or something and they ended up hanging out with 
Stefan from the Deftones, B Real from Cypress Hill, Dino from Fear Factory. And they all hung out one night, and all those guys they they had heard like some early demo of Dead Inside. And at that point, Stefan was like, "Hey man, I like this stuff." He said to Mark and Jim, "When you guys come out to record, hit me up, and and I'll come by and we'll do a song." And they were got they were like, "All right." You know, probably just another one of those moments where you don't think it's really going to happen or whatever. And it ended up happening. I'll get to that. But um, also, and he said, hey, what kind of guitars are you guys playing? And Mark's like, oh, you know, we're playing Ibanez or something at the time. I think maybe Mark had a Schecter, but I know Jason and I had Ibanez's. And, um, and he goes, well, yeah, I'll hook you guys up with the ESP guitars when you come out. Just give me a call on your way out. Again, it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. So sure enough. We're a couple hours from LA, driving out there in the van with, actually, before we left, we went to Guitar Center and uh, and, and bought all new gear. And, I, and Jason and I wanted to buy guitars and Mark kept saying, no, 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 let's see if Stefan will come through. Let's not spend any money on guitars here. Let's, let's just see what happens with Stefan. So we're like, all right. So we head out that way. We were a couple hours away from California. Mark calls Stefan and says, Hey, we're, we're going to be there soon. You said to give you a ring, um, maybe about ESP guitars. Stefan's like, all right, I'll call you right back. Sure enough, he calls back in like five minutes. He's like, all right, I just spoke with my guys over at ESP, and they want you to show up there at the, uh, the warehouse tomorrow at noon. And we're like, okay. So we get to our, you know, our hotels. We were, we were staying at these apartments called the Oakwoods, these like furnished apartments in, in L.A., during the uh, recording and mixing process of Pass Out, which was awesome. Um, but sure enough, we, we go over the next day, we sh- arrive at ESP, meet the ESP guys, awesome guys, Matt, Todd, I think uh, Marsh was a guy there at the time, Marsh Gooch. And, um, and uh, you know, they, they, they invite us in, uh, shake our hands and, and say, hey, well, let's take you back in the warehouse and see what you want. And this whole time, we're just like, what's happening right now? You know, this is insane. We go back into the into the warehouse. There's just you know uh, shelves uh, two stories high, from what I remember, of just different guitars and everything. They're like, "Go ahead, guys. T- you know, take what you want. Why don't you guys start with a couple each, and um, you know, we'll go from there." And we're like, "All right." So each of us just picked out whatever two guitars we want. And this is Jim, Hagar, myself, and Mark. So we picked out eight guitars that day. Uh, and on the way out, they said, uh, Todd said to me, you know, give us a call and we'll start talking about some custom guitars. And we're just like, all right. So it's seriously insane that that's how it happened. From there on, we've just had this amazing relationship with, with ESB. Thank you so much to you guys over the years who have hooked us up. And, and the good thing is, is that they are the most fantastic instruments. I, uh, I, I back them 100%. Every instrument is made so well. They play like butter. They're just killer guitars. Obviously, Matt and I ended up having the Signature Series, the RA600 and the MFA600. My customs are just fantastic. Uh, you know, and, and it's just a dream come true. Thank you so much, Stefan. Uh, so then, that happens, and you know, Steph says, hey, you know, how about this Saturday? I'll come by and write a song with you guys. So we're like, okay. So he comes by Third Stone, the, the studio we were at, and um, shows up with a guitar. Matt DeVries, who hadn't joined Kamira yet, didn't even know he was going to join Kamira yet, happened to be out just visiting. He came out to just hang out while we were recording because he was a friend of the band, and he and Jason Hagar played together in Ascension before Kamira. And when Hagar ended up having to leave, Matt was the choice right away. He's like, hey, Matt should step in and take my spot, and that's what happened. That's how Matt joined Kamira. But before all that, um, Stefan kind of like thought Matt maybe was like a tech or something there and, and asked him to restring his guitar. So Matt didn't say no. He's just like, all right. <laughs> so he's restringing Stefan's guitar for him to get ready. Stefan sits down, just starts playing some riffs. Andals gets on the drums and we just start writing Rizzo riff by riff. Um, just kind of talking about it. Just how you write a song with anybody. So he was there. Um, we wrote the whole song together. I'd say that they're 80 or 90 percent his riffs um and then he and i went back in and and tracked it after we wrote it and completed it all in one day uh mark probably did vocals for it you know while he did the other vocals later on in the session after all the music had been recorded um but again that's just my recollection but but super cool amazing thing to happen to our young band at that time so many incredible things happened to us um we got lucky in so many ways 
we're so blessed with the ESP endorsement, so blessed with Stefan's endorsement. Um, that obviously brought us a lot of notoriety. Seeing Stefan wear Kamira shirts at Rock 'em Ring in front of, I've heard a million people go, attended that festival. Seeing him wearing the shirts at different things, I mean, it's just, just super cool, super surreal. I can't even believe it. I have to pinch myself, um, you know. But moral of the story, to sum all this up, from my influences to the ESP thing to Stefan, from the Deftones jamming with us on our first record, is that anything can happen. You can get lucky. I did, we did, you can too. Hard work, a great attitude, talent, chemistry with your band, dedication, pushing forward, doing things to set yourself aside, set yourself apart from the rest of the pack, pushing the envelope, trying to be unique, trying to improve your recordings, your productions, making quality music for people. Do that, everything else will fall into place. You know, so many bands think about making shirts first and stickers and none of that stuff matters. Great music matters. If you do that, other people will come into your lives that will offer to make your shirts, that will offer to make your stickers, that will help you get on tours, all that kind of stuff. But you got to do the work first. Be cool, guys. Show up at the venues. Being professional, having a great attitude, like I said, and good things will happen to you. You could get lucky just like we did. So... That's going to conclude this episode here, and I hope everybody enjoyed it, learned a little something, had some of those burning questions answered. I appreciate you hanging out this long with me, and I encourage you to check out my Patreon page where you can help support me make these videos and music I've got coming out. Um, you can do that at patreon.com slash robarnoldworld. I got that same handle for all the socials where you can find me there, where I'm posting information mainly about these videos and things, but uh, just cool stuff. If you want to get involved, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much. If you like this video, hitting that thumbs up will help other people see it. That's how the whole thing works. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I will see everybody soon on episode six. Cheers. Cheers.